Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, just again to highlight a couple of our announcements that uh, we continue our our midweek Lenten worship services at 6 p.m. and 6.30 following worship for a guided uh, devotion here in the gym. So again, we'd invite you to come to that. And also our Easter Sunday schedule, we'll be having a 7 o'clock worship service that will be a drive-in sunrise service on Easter Sunday, and then 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So um, very similar to our regular Easter uh, schedule, except for the addition of our sunrise service, and that again will be a drive-in. So uh, we want to invite people that maybe are also not feeling that they can worship indoors yet, that they're not, that this isn't the time for that. They can come to our drive-in time and join us together for worship in the parking lot uh, and give thanks and praise to God for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And I believe that is all the announcements that I have for us, other than uh, your bulletin says it's last week. So just so everybody knows, it is this week if that's of any help. Today is March 7th, and I believe next Saturday into Sunday we turn the clocks ahead an hour. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. All right, awesome. So I'll be tired. Right now, <laughs> right now it would be 10.30, and you'd be almost done with the sermon. So, uh, so next week uh, we do set the clocks ahead, and, uh, uh, and next week it will be March 14th. So let us begin our worship with our order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who brings us safely through the sea, who gives us water from the rock, who leads us into the land of milk and honey. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Have mercy on us. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For longing to have what is not ours and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty. For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For jealousies that divide families and nations and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. Holy God, holy and mighty. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God and for carelessness with the fruits of creation. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Through the Holy Spirit, God cleanses us and gives us the power to proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us join in singing our opening hymn, The Lamb, and we'll be singing verses 1 and 3.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading is from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all of these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make of your, for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your, Lord, Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Okay. Thanks be to God. God.
gospel this day comes from the Gospel of John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their table. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And we invite our students to, who are here with us today to follow Renata to the lounge for our Spark Church time. If only I could move that quickly. <laughs> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. How can I say that week after week? How can we believe it week after week? Jesus, who appears maybe a bit less warm and fuzzy as he's often pictured, appears that way a little bit in our gospel lesson today, gives us what I would call an object lesson as he throws the money changers and the animals for sacrifice out of the temple and gives us reason to understand and know those words, your sins are forgiven you are true. The work that the money changers were doing and the sellers of doves and lambs and other animals at the temple was really a necessary part of the sacrificial system that the Jewish people participated in. Participated in. Making sacrifice was a part of the religious life of Jewish people, sometimes for atonement, uh, sometimes for cleansing, just as when uh, Jesus was born and Mary and Joseph made a sacrifice for redeeming Jesus. Sometimes sacrifices were made on behalf of the whole of the Jewish people. But things in the temple were not always being done the way they were supposed to be done. The sacrificial system had changed a bit over the years, and it had become basically a very efficient machine for fleecing both the rich and the poor, and earning a great deal of money for those who ran that and for the people uh, who allowed it to continue. If you went to the, to the temple to make the sacrifice of an animal according to the law of Moses, you could bring your own animal, but for many who traveled over a long distance, this wasn't very practical for them to bring an animal with them, and it wasn't as if they could easily find an animal. And so when they would get to the temple, they would be able to buy whatever animal it was they needed to make a sacrifice for maybe 10 times the price they would pay for buying the animal somewhere else. Now, again, you could bring your own animal, but if you did, it had to be inspected. And when the animal was inspected, it had to be free of any blemish, any mark at all. The problem was that, of course, 
If your animal passed inspection, you could use it for sacrifice. But if it didn't, you would have to then go and buy an animal from the people selling them at the temple. And you'll never guess what happened. For the most part, animals didn't pass inspection. So you would have to buy one from the people there. It's kind of like going to the movie theater, and I know most of us haven't been able to do that recently, but when you go to the movie theater, if you didn't get caught, let's say, you could bring your own popcorn. And how much would it cost to pop a good-sized bag of popcorn? Maybe a quarter? Popcorn is not expensive. So if you could bring in that popcorn for a quarter, great. That would be fantastic. It would save you a lot of money. But if not, if you weren't able to bring that in there, you could buy popcorn, of course, at the movie theater for $7.50 for a quart-sized container of popcorn or something along those lines with your $5 soda. And so your adventure to the movie theater for $16 for tickets for two plus $85 in popcorn and soda, kind of like going to the temple. Similar idea. They could have brought their own animal, but generally it wasn't allowed, so they had to buy the temple ones, and they were much, much more expensive. So it wasn't just animals as well. There was also a temple tax. So when we talk about, oftentimes it's talking about Jesus throwing out the money changers. But you'll notice in our scripture verse, it does emphasize actually the animals as part of that. And I'm going to come back to that. What's the term is so popular. I'm going to circle back to the animals. But the money changers as well, it wasn't a very different scenario. You needed to have, you need to pay your temple tax. You were supposed to pay this amount every year. The problem was that to pay it, you needed a special coin. So if you happen to come from anywhere out in the world, um, the Jewish people had been scattered. So there were people that would come from Greece. There were people that would come from Egypt. There were people that come from Asia Minor, from all different places. They would gather to the temple. They would come there, and they would look to pay their temple tax. But unfortunately, all they had were Roman coins or other countries' coins, and the temple wouldn't accept them. Fortunately, the money changers were there, and they would let you buy the appropriate coin. So the nice thing is you could take that 50 cents you were supposed to pay in temple tax, you could take your $35 in Roman money and buy a 50 cent piece. I think they have things like that on TV now, where you can buy the limited edition of this half dollar that's for only $99.99, and it'll be worth... 51 cents in five years, so it'll be a good investment. It'll increase 2% annually. But you could go ahead and buy your coin there, and you had to use a specific coin. So the, the people selling the animals and the money changers actually did serve a real purpose. Unfortunately, they did so while stealing from the people that they sold these items to. They were robbing. They were committing thievery. But I don't think it, that's the end of it that was fully the reason for Jesus creating a whip of cords that he found and, and casting people out of there. I don't think it was the sale of the animals. I don't think it was the, the very poor exchange rate with the convenience fee. I made a car payment, and because I made it online, I'm charged a convenience fee. It, I don't think it's convenient to give people my money, so I'm not sure how that works. It's, I think it's more convenient for them to get my money, so I think they should pay me the convenience fee, but that's basically the way it worked in the temple. But think about what was going on. The corruption that was happening there, the, the people that were selling the coins and selling the animals, were basically creating a block, a stop, for the people of God to be able to participate. So you would come to the temple and you, you were poor and you had nothing but this one sheep and you wanted to use it for sacrifice, but unfortunately, it had a mole on its left hind quarter buried beneath the wool that was able to be found by this inspector who looked very, very carefully to find this. And now it couldn't be used. But now you have no money to buy another one. You can't afford the prices in the temple, so what does that mean? 
If the sacrifice was needed for the forgiveness of your sins, what happens to your sins? But they remain with you. So it creates a barrier between you and God. It kept the people of God from being able to be with God, to be able to relate to God, to know his forgiveness, to know his care for them. It was taken away. And the funny part of it is, I think that, uh, not funny, haha, funny, but the, the part of that that I think is, is really probably most troublesome is to think that, you know who I imagine most people blamed was God himself, not the money changers and not the people selling the animals. But God, why won't you do this for me? Why won't you forgive me? Why won't you help me? But it was these people who were standing in the way, creating the stumbling block for the people of God to be able to be in relationship with God. Sin separates people from God. We understand that. But now we added a layer of human-made bureaucracy to further separate people from God. People who would never realize God's forgiveness, who wouldn't know the graciousness of God because people were standing in the way. And so Jesus throws these people out. He casts them out of the temple that are doing this. He casts away the people that were not just stealing money, but stealing people from God. Stealing people from a relationship with God. But it goes even further, and it's emphasized in our gospel lesson today, that God, or that Jesus expels the animals. He gets the animals out of there. You can tell there were no cats used for sacrifice because they just would have sat there and stared at him no matter what he was doing. I've learned that from cats. But he chases the animals out. And I was reading something that said, well, you know why he wanted to get rid of the animals? Because animals make doo-doo, and it's dirty, and they didn't want, Jesus didn't want that there. I don't think Jesus cared about recycled food from animals. But he drives the animals out, which creates a situation. So you come to Jerusalem, you come to the temple, and you're going to make sacrifice. Or you're like Jesus' parents, the redemption for Jesus. They gave the turtle doves. And you're going to do that, but you get there, and there's nothing there. There's no animals. You can't pay the temple tax. Well, how many of us are that upset if we can't pay taxes? Okay, so that one may be not a big deal for the people, but they can't make their sacrifice which means they can't be in right standing with God because all the animals have been taken away. There's nothing there which people can sacrifice for their sins. Jesus leaves no way for people to be reconciled with God by chasing the animals out. And people say oftentimes when they look at the, the cleansing of the temple, as it's called, that Jesus was fighting. He was fighting injustice. Well, yeah, to, to a certain degree, yes. But I think it's far more radical in what he does. He makes an incredibly bold statement, which is what allows us to say, your sins are forgiven. He makes a statement here that I believe supports that directly, because what he is doing is he is dismantling the system of sacrificial atonement, of sacrificing an animal for the forgiveness of your sins, a system that's been practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years. Because there's only one thing left to sacrifice in the temple. And what is that one thing? Who is that that's left? It's Jesus. Because the people come to him and they say to him, Give us a reason for why you just did what you did. I don't think they were that upset. I mean, some were upset that they weren't going to be getting the uh, revenues anymore by casting these people out. But give us a reason why you think you can get rid of all these sacrificial animals and this is okay. And Jesus says, destroy this temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They didn't understand as it says in the scriptures, they didn't get it at that time. His disciples recalled those words after Jesus rose from the dead. But what he was saying to them is, I am the sacrifice. And when I am sacrificed, there is no more need for lambs and turtle doves and any other animals to be sacrificed. I'm it. I am the once and for all. 
I am the final statement, the final revelation, the last sacrifice that needs to be made for the forgiveness of sins and to establish a right standing between God and his people. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And his words are basically mocked at the time because nobody understood what he was saying. But he made a statement for us to say, in my presence here and in my sacrifice, your sins are forgiven and will be forever. You don't have to make any sacrifice of an animal. You don't have to come and pay the temple tax. From this day forward, know that your sins are forgiven. Know that your sins are forgiven completely because I have paid the price. And I have paid that price for you. Jesus became the sacrifice for us, for the people who were in the temple that day, for all people throughout the world. Jesus' blood has atoned for the sins of all of us. And nothing more, nothing more was or will ever need, or will ever be needed. Nothing more will ever be needed. Jesus has done it so that each week and every day and every moment we may hear those words from God. Your sins have been forgiven. Amen. And let us join in singing our hymn of the day. And we'll be singing verses 1 and 4 of Canticle of the Turning. on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church, that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. 
The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders who will guide us in the ways of good stewardship and that all people might properly care for what you have made. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all people. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially Dick, Chris, Tracy, Nancy, Joanna, Molly, Elaine, Cynthia, Margo, Mary, Carol, Lynn, Bob, Carol, Jane, Dan, Leona, Gary, Wayne, Lexi, Nanette, Emily, Sandy, Nate, Frank, Carol, Al, Audrey, Steve, Bradley, Ken, Dan, Peggy, Verge, Beverly, Charlotte, Walt, Karen, Jeremy, Sean, John, Robert, Dagmar, Heather, Tanya, Becca, and Kathy, that Jesus would bring healing and wholeness and make his presence known. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity and mission and calling to all of us in this congregation that we might follow Christ beyond these walls, beyond our own habits and comfort, beyond fears and doubts. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel and grant us hearts, minds, and bodies that will go out boldly into the world to proclaim the good news through word and deed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Give, sal thank give thanks to God for the salvation we have received through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the night in which he was betrayed, gave thanks, took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And together let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you to remove your mask at this time and use the hand sanitizer that you'll find on your table. And if you would take the communion elements that you will find on your table and open the upper portion of the cellophane portion to reveal the bread, which by the word of God has become the body of Christ. And take and eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then if you would open the lower portion to reveal the blood of Christ. 
and take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And I invite you to uh, return your mask and again use the sanitizer as needed. And let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And let us join in singing verses 1 and 5 of I Am the Bread of Life. forth in our closing good words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. And let us go forth this day in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.